With the coming of modern warfare and massed mechanical armies, the age of the chivalrous knight doing battle, one-on-one -on, -one on the field, has long since vanished. However, there still remains one bastion that best upholds that ancient philosophy. You need only look up high above the battlefield to the brave fighter pilot. The first fighter aircraft were flimsy scraps of wood and fabric flown by keen-eyed men with fast reflexes and deadly determination. Today's fighter jets are constructed from the most sophisticated materials available and are flown at incredible speeds by the world's best trained pilots. And the span between them is less than 100 years, a century of striving for the most efficient aerial fighting machine. Early Royal Flying Corps pilots were sent to the front, equipped with a revolver, small stove, and packets of chocolate, bouillon, and meat. Their instructions were to ram any zeppelins they encountered. As the war continued, pilots attacked with pistols, rifles, hand grenades, and grappling hooks. The first aerial victory was won by French pilot Sergeant Joseph France and his observer, Queneau, who brought down a German Taube using a voisin with a machine gun mounted in the cockpit. The first generation of fighter aeroplanes were primitive, but fast and maneuverable. However, their effectiveness depended on a new breed, the fighter pilot. Keen eyesight, stamina, and lightning quick judgment were essential. But even those traits would not necessarily be enough to save the pilot from a fiery death. Nevertheless, the skies were seen as a place to escape from the horrors of the trench war. Here I was in mud up to my knees, wrote one infantryman turned pilot, while other fellows were sailing around in the clean air. French air ace Roland Garros flew a 1915 Morin Saunier L monoplane with a machine gun that fired through the propeller, with which he took out three German aircraft in just 18 days. When he was forced to make an emergency landing behind enemy lines, Garros's monoplane was sent to the factory of Dutch aeroplane manufacturer Anthony Fokker. Born in the Dutch East Indies, Fokker became fascinated with aviation in 1908, aged 18, when he read about Wilbur Wright's exhibition flights in France. He built his first aircraft two years later and soon set up his own German-based manufacturing company. When the First World War started, the German government took over his factory, retaining Fokker as a director and aircraft designer. After examining the Garros monoplane, Fokker was concerned that a bullet could be deflected by the propeller back onto the pilot or aircraft. So his engineers developed the synchronizer that enabled the bullet to fire through the blades. Major Charles Biddle wrote of the invention, the engine revolves at least 1,000 turns per minute. And as there are two chances for the gun to fire for each revolution, this would allow the gun to fire 2,000 shots per minute. The weapon was fitted to Eindecker monoplanes, and German pilots quickly mastered it, swooping down on Allied planes from behind in a steep dive. The British dubbed it the Fokker Scourge and lost many aircraft. It wasn't until the French introduced their own solo fighter, the Newport series, that the Eindecker's superiority could be challenged. Other effective German fighters included the Albatross series, including the Albatross D3 and Albatross D5. Both inflicted heavy casualties on the Royal Flying Corps, but were not quite up to the standard of the SE-5A or the SPAD. The art of aerial warfare was spectacular and daring, but American air ace Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was blunt in his assessment of this new style of war. Fighting in the air is not sport, he said. It is scientific murder. The highest casualties occurred when opposing squadrons met in what became known as a dogfight. 
the sky would be filled with combat planes twisting and turning to get enough advantage to deliver a deadly stream of machine gun fire into their target. Up against the German warplanes were British-built aircraft, including the Airco DH-2, an early single-seater with a forward-firing gun and a pusher engine. The Avro 504, a hugely successful all-wooden two-bay biplane, and the Vickers FB-5 gun bus, one of the first fighters. But with airplanes like the Vickers slow and unwieldy, the British desperately needed a generation of more effective flying machines. It was up to English aviation pioneer Thomas Sopwith to come to the rescue. Sopwith took up flying after seeing John Moisant's famous channel crossing in 1910. He set up the Sopwith Aviation Company two years later and designed a tractor biplane that reached a record height of 13,000 feet. Sopwith's company produced a number of fighter aircraft during the war, which greatly contributed to Britain's air supremacy. The most famous was the Sopwith Camel, which was credited with destroying 1,294 enemy aircraft. Famously difficult to fly, the Camel was so called because the grouping of engine, guns and pilot looked like a hump. The Sopwith design gave the fighter unparalleled maneuverability. It could fly up to 20,000 feet and had a top speed of 120 miles per hour. Designed by a team led by Henry P. Follard at the Royal Aircraft Factory in Farnborough, the SE-5A was a single-seater biplane with dihedral wings. It was the favoured aircraft of the greatest Allied air aces, and its only drawback, an unreliable engine, was soon fixed with the introduction of the Viper V-8. The SE-5A was the first Allied pursuit plane to carry two machine guns, a Lewis gun on the top wing and a side-mounted Vickers gun in front of the cockpit. Dressed in a leather, fleece-lined jacket to counter the icy temperatures aloft, sporting a silk scarf and oil-smeared goggles, the fighter pilot was a romantic figure. French-American pilot Raoul Lafpré was one of the men seen as heroes of the sky due to his 17 combat victories. Sadly, he was killed in action in 1918. Other famous airmen included war artist Lieutenant Henri Faré, Flight Commander George W. Hewlett, and Flight Sub-Lieutenant Reginald Warnford, who was awarded a Victoria Cross for destroying German airship LZ-37 in mid-air. French fighter René Fonck had the most Allied kills, taking down 75 aeroplanes. But even he was eclipsed by the man who both sides agreed was the greatest fighter pilot of them all. The Red Baron was born Manfred von Richthofen, the son of an aristocratic German family. He joined the Imperial German Army Air Service in May 1915 and soon qualified as a pilot, eventually credited with 80 combat kills. Before long, Richthofen was given command of his own squadron. The Baron's most famous aircraft was the Fokker triplane, machines which he said could climb like monkeys and maneuver like the devil. But by the time they came into service, he was considered to be a legend and ordered not to fly in combat unless absolutely necessary. In 1918, he was put back to work as part of the Germans' big air offensive. The new British Camels proved no obstacle for the air ace who downed 17 aircraft in March and April, eight of them Camels. But on the 21st of April 1918, he was shot down and killed, most likely by an Australian anti-aircraft gunner following a dogfight. To the British, flying high above the mud and misery of the trenches, the air war was a place for gentlemen. After German air ace Oswald Birke was killed in an air battle, a unit of the Royal Flying Corps flew across enemy lines and dropped a wreath that read, to the memory of Captain Birke, our brave and chivalrous foe. The Great War spurred on aeronautical development and fueled a boom in aeroplane manufacture. But the end of the war saw a huge drop in aircraft production in the United States, with the annual figure dropping from 14,000 in 1918 to 263 in 1922. 
The American people wanted to forget everything relating to war, and more than 100,000 combat pilots were demobilized. Other countries were more gradual in phasing out their military expenditure. The French government continued to commission aircraft and used the surplus to subsidize the new field of commercial aviation. Sopwith joined Australian Harry Hawker to form the H.G. Hawker Engineering Company, which manufactured military aircraft including the Fury, the Hart and the Nimrod. Civil flying resumed in 1919 and passenger services were established for short routes within Europe and America, usually made up of ex-military aeroplanes flown by ex-military pilots. Conditions were far from luxurious, and one carrier, Aircraft Transport and Travel, issued passengers with thick coats, helmets, goggles and gloves, and sometimes hot water bottles. In the early 1920s, the advent of large aircraft carriers brought new opportunities for fighter aircraft. At the beginning of the war, Britain's Royal Navy had converted four cross-channel steamers into seaplane carriers. However, taking off and landing at sea proved to be a tricky business, impossible except in perfect conditions. On October the 17th, 1922, Lieutenant Virgil C. Griffin took off in a Vought VE-7 biplane from the Langley's decks launching the U.S. Navy into a new era. The development of the Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine in the mid-1920s was a major step forward for American aircraft. A nine-cylinder radial of first 400, then 600 horsepower, the Wasp improved the maneuverability and speed and rate of climb of Army and Navy aircraft. The interwar years saw the Germans secretly build up their air force, as the Treaty of Versailles had banned the losers of the First World War from rearming. The German air force was known as the Luftwaffe, and its first fighters were traditional fabric-covered biplanes. At first, pilots were convinced that only biplanes with their open cockpits and fast turning speeds could be effective fighters. But the development of the Messerschmitt Bf 109 boot paid to that theory. The BF-109 featured an all-metal stressed skin and a slim fuselage with a sideways-hinged cockpit canopy. It first saw active service during the Spanish Civil War, serving as a highly effective fighter bomber and remained in production throughout the Second World War. We are now in possession of one of William Messerschmitt's latest models. This is the ME-109F, Germany's very newest fighter plane. The Nazi pilot, a certain Captain Pingel, a Prussian officer who wears corsets and claims to have destroyed 22 British aircraft, thought he could outwit the RAF gunners, but ended up in a forced landing near St. Margaret's Bay. As a result of his swollen headedness, all the closely guarded secrets of the new plane are disclosed to our research experts. Slap Happy Herman will be cross. As the clouds of war gathered over Europe in the late 1930s, Britain's Hawker Aircraft Company produced its own exceptional fighter, the Hawker Hurricane. A monoplane development of the single-seat interceptor fighter, the Hawker Fury, the Hurricane entered service in late 1937 and swiftly proved indispensable against German bombers when hostilities broke out two years later. The Hurricane was built around Rolls-Royce's Merlin engine, a liquid-cooled V-12 cylinder. Its cockpit was placed high in the fuselage to give the pilot good visibility, and the aircraft was armed with 12.303-inch Browning machine guns. When the first Luftwaffe bombers dropped their deadly nighttime payloads over southern England in late 1940, the British had no answer. On the 15th of November, after Coventry was attacked, the air minister wrote to the prime minister, Last night, 300 German aircraft converged on a known target. 100 fighters were airborne, yet the only casualty is claimed neither by the fighters nor by the guns. It wasn't until its scientists perfected radar operations that Britain made headway in the Battle of Britain. The concept of using radio waves to identify aircraft in flight had been around for some time, but the British were the first to set up radar stations. 
Positioned along the southern and eastern coasts of Britain, they scanned the skies for Luftwaffe bombers, pinpointing them even in poor weather and darkness. Packs of fighters were then launched into attack with the advantage of knowing the precise position of their targets. Among these fighters were 20 squadrons of Supermarine Spitfires. A single-seater monoplane, the thin cross-section on its elliptical wing enabled it to reach higher speeds than its contemporaries. It was the only Allied airplane to serve out the whole war. Like the Hurricane, the Spitfire was armed with eight Browning .303 caliber machine guns and powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Together, the two aircraft were incomparable. But their strategic advantage owed more to radar than aircraft design. Instead of flying blind sorties in the hope of spotting enemy planes, the Battle of Britain fighters could rest comfortably on the ground until the radar found its target. Then it was a mad scramble as pilots ran to their airplanes and headed into the sky. But it was a dangerous game. Britain's pilots included many from Commonwealth countries, as well as those who escaped before Hitler cast his net over Eastern Europe. The fighter tactics adopted before the air war started proved costly, as the rigid formations were predicated on attack from bombers, not escort fighters. The British were fighting for their lives, with Germany poised to invade under Operation Sea Lion as soon as its bombers cowed the British people. But they were a people who refused to be cowed. And autumn 1940 saw fighter command finally gain the ascendancy. Germany was bombing British cities day and night. The first official record of aerial combat in the sky. In a moment you will see what our pilots see in action. There in front is a German and we're overhauling him. Streaks on the screen are the tracer bullets from our fighter. hit and there he goes on fire and down to destruction so fighter command put radar equipped night fighters into the field to pick off the night bombers presenting our latest and most heavily armed fighter planes bristol bow fighters among them the bristol type 156 bow fighter the bow fighters twin engines are bristol the bow was heavy and slow rushed off the assembly line to bolster the air force but it was still faster than the lumbering german bombers in its sights with four 20 millimeter cannons mounted in the lower fuselage to allow radar antennae to be fitted the bow had a high success rate against its adversaries for night fighting after the Battle of Britain, bows were redeployed to the North African and Mediterranean theatres of war, where they enjoyed similar successes. The North Coats strike wing used bow fighters to suppress anti-aircraft flak, while Torbo fighters attacked ship convoys closer to the ocean. Ten guns, enough to blast any enemy machine out of the skies. Sunset and the work of our night fighter pilot. The Bolton Paul Defiant was another night fighter set against the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain. The two seater fighter entered service in 1939 and initially looked set to match its cousins, the Spitfire and the Hurricane. However, while the Defiant was faster than the Spitfire, it had no forward firepower, instead, relying on the hydraulically operated dorsal turret. At first, this was to its advantage, as the Germans were not expecting an aeroplane that fired from the rear. The Defiant collected the scalps of numerous bombers and BF-109s. But once the Luftwaffe wised up, the Defiant was easy prey. Into the moonlight over Britain they roar, seeking out their prey. Clumsy in dogfights and difficult to bail from, the Defiant was redeployed to night fighting, where it had better success. But the limitations imposed by the weight of its turret and the fact that it carried a second crew member led to big losses, and the Defiant was pulled from combat in 1942. It finally found its niche in gunnery training, target towing, communications jamming, and air-sea rescue. The Brits also put American fighters into service. The Grumman F-4F Wildcat was Grumman's first monoplane and flew with both the United States and the British navies. 
both land and carrier based, it was a Wildcat that became the first American built fighter to score a kill in 1940 when it brought down a Junkers Ju 88 bomber. When the United States entered the war, the Wildcat was its main shipboard aircraft. Although the Japanese Mitsubishi Zero was a faster aeroplane, the Wildcat's rugged construction enabled it to absorb more damage and kept it in the fight. Wildcats were vital defenders in the battles for Wake Island, the Coral Sea, Midway and Guadalcanal. The interceptor pursuit P-38. It has been developed solely for national defense and army officials consider it the fastest military plane in the world today. The P-38, a man-made comet. The Lockheed P-38 Lightning was another American fighter to make its name in the Pacific theater of war. Its unusual design included weapons mounted in the nose, firing crisscross trajectories that gave it a range of up to a thousand yards. The Lightning was the first American fighter to incorporate stainless steel and smooth, flush-riveted, butt-jointed aluminum skin panels as well as the first to fly faster than 400 miles an hour. Its twin Allison engines gave it an extra level of safety, with a number of lightnings limping home on one engine. When it appeared from out of the blue and swooped into service for Japan against America at Pearl Harbor, the Mitsubishi A6 M50 outclassed every Allied fighter in the Pacific. The little airplane had exceptional maneuverability and unparalleled range and was the first carrier-borne aircraft to have better performance than land-based ones. The first Zeros were piloted by highly trained airmen and quickly established the ascendancy over Allied forces. However, heavy losses reduced the numbers of experienced pilots and future encounters were weighted more heavily towards the Americans. Clever tactics developed by the American military included flying in formation of two fighter planes and waiting for a Zero to come up on the tail of one of them. The two American airplanes would turn towards each other and the Zero thus come into the sights of the oncoming plane, making it simple to pick it off. Tactics like this caused huge casualties for the Japanese Air Force and helped the Americans win the battles of Midway and the Coral Sea, despite having inferior fighters at the time. The Nakajima Ki-43 was Japan's best fighter, known in Allied circles as Oscar. A single-seater, it saw its first action in 1943 and addressed the need for a maneuverable aeroplane capable of delivering heavy fire. The aircraft's Hayate engine gave it a much better climb rate and a top speed comparable to the P-51D Mustang and the P-47D Thunderbolt. With both sides desperately looking for the technology that would blow the opposition out of the water, World War II was an important time for aerospace development. As the home of the world's first serious rocket tests, Germany led the way in jet aircraft, launching the ME-163 Comet in 1944. The revolutionary swept wing fighter came from Alexander Lippisch, famous for his rocket research throughout the 1930s. The Comet contained a Walter rocket motor that harnessed the explosive power of rocket fuel to send the aircraft speeding through the air at an unmatchable 990 kilometers an hour. The jet ran rings around its Allied opponents, but its short range led to many missions being aborted. Landing had its own share of dangers, as the pilot had to use a spring-loaded skid running centerline on the fuselage. Ultimately, the Comets made little impact in the war, other than to increase the knowledge of jet propulsion. Of the 300 produced, they made only nine kills. Fourteen Comets were lost, with several destroyed during landings. The Germans had also been working on the jet engine well before the beginning of the war. The airframe design first flew in 1941, using a conventional Junkers Jumo engine. When the turbofan engine was perfected, it was fitted to the swept wing Messerschmitt 262 and flown in July 1942. The ME262 went into operational service over a long period of time, 
as new tactics and procedures were developed for the first jet fighter ever to fly. Dubbed the Schwalbe, or Swallow, pilots like to call her the Stormbird. Several prototype designs were developed, and in 1944, a test unit was put into service. The multi-role fighter made its first kill of a Mosquito reconnaissance plane in July of that year. The plane had a top speed of 900 kilometers per hour with a ceiling of 11,450 meters. It carried four 30 millimeter cannons and could carry 24 55 millimeter rockets or two 250 kilogram bombs. A total of 1,430 were manufactured, but they saw little combat towards the end of the war. The RAF have no records of any engagements with the jet fighter. However, the US Army Air Force did claim to have shot down several in dogfights. The Gloucester Meteor was Britain's first jet fighter, entering service in 1944. Despite not being as advanced as the Comet, Meteors flew in active duty for decades, a testament to its designers. The Meteor's strength was the simplicity of its design, a simple all-metal body with low-mounted straight wings, two spars, twin turbojets, and a high-mounted horizontal tailplane. When it came into service, the Meteor was no faster than conventional airplanes, but its ability to maintain speed at low altitudes made it a valuable asset against the V-1 German flying bombs. The end of World War II did not mean an end to fighter aircraft development. Europe was divided by the victors into East and West, setting the scene for the simmering hostilities of the Cold War. One of the first places to see this hostility erupt was Korea in 1950. The Korean War became an arena for the superpowers to test their new weaponry, among them the jet fighter. The world's fastest plane, the jet propelled shooting star. It hurtles through space at nearly nine miles a minute. Thus, the United States had the opportunity to test its first jet fighter in combat. The Lockheed F-80C Shooting Star made its maiden flight in 1944, but never saw action during World War II. Instead, the F-80C became the first aeroplane to take part in an all-jet fighter battle when it shot down a Russian MiG-15 on November the 8th, 1950. New York to Paris in six hours. The Soviets had also provided Lavochkin LA-11s to the Chinese for use in the war. The piston-engined fighter flew many combat air control missions, downing both bombers and fighters. Jets include these Jacks, the Red's first jet fighter, probably based on German models. A hundred miles faster than the Yaks are two newer models, the Lavochkin... But the MiG's advanced design made it the favored aircraft of the Reds, and its primary target was the destructive B-29 Super Fortress bomber. MiG-15 fighters stalked the Super Fortress, armed with two 23mm cannons capable of firing 80 rounds per gun, and a 37mm gun with a 40-round capacity. It was well equipped to shoot down bombers, but less able to engage in dogfights because of the weapon's limited rate of fire and relatively low velocity. However, it was usually able to evade pursuit with a rate of climb 900 meters per minute faster than American-built Sabres. The MiG's smooth silver outer skin, bubble canopy, and metal-skinned wing certainly caught people's attention. But despite the MiG's advantages, the superior training of the American pilots gave them the ascendancy, and F-86 managed a kill ratio of 8 to 1 against the Chinese fighters. Our Russian-made jets behave in battle with American planes can be seen as Navy Panthers take off on missions over North Korea. Gun sight cameras record for the first time in history a battle between jet fighters as the Panther... The Grumman F-9F Panther, the U.S. Navy's second jet fighter, was also successful against Chinese forces, shooting down two Yak-9s and five MiG-15s with a loss of only one Panther. The fighter flew 78,000 sorties during the war and remained in service until 1956, when it was used for training missions. The F-86 Sabre was the MiG's other primary opponent. 
Developed in both fighter-bomber and fighter-interceptor variations, the transonic fighter carried 12.7mm AN M3 Browning machine guns that fired at a rate of 1,200 rounds per minute. In 1948, an F-86A set a world speed record of 570 miles per hour. MiGs had the advantage when at high altitudes, Sabres at low, which made most dogfights short as the fighters scrambled to their optimum level. Sabres went on to fly in conflicts across the region, including the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965 and the Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971. The Australian, Canadian and German Air Forces were among the many that acquired or built Sabres in the years following the Korean War. The success of their early MiG models encouraged the Soviets to move forward and develop the MiG-25 Foxbat, which rolled off the production line in 1964 and went into service six years later. The Space Age design included vacuum tube electronics, two turbojet engines and titanium parts to counter the stresses found when the aircraft hit Mach 2. The MiG-25 was capable of reaching extreme altitudes and a modified Foxbat set a jet world altitude record in 1977 when it zoomed briefly to 37,650 meters. Soviet propaganda talked up the MiG-25 as an exceptional air combat fighter with above average agility. The Americans were so spooked they set up the program that resulted in the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle. But the MiG-25 was less maneuverable than the Americans had been led to believe, with limited combat potential. However, it's still in service today in several air forces. After the war, the Brits also forged ahead with jet technology, launching the English Electric Lightning in 1954. The supersonic jet fighter airplane was memorable for its high speeds and natural metal exterior. The first British jets were the Gloucester Meteor and the de Havilland Vampire, but the electric was a major step forward. Its climb rate of 5,000 feet per second is impressive even by today's standards. In 1962, the Lightning was involved in test flights that reached 87,300 feet, at which distance the pilot reported, Earth curvature was visible and the sky was quite dark, but control-wise it was on a knife edge. Following on from Korea, the conflict in Indochina during the 1950s and 60s was another arena where the superpowers and their allies showcased and tested new aviation technology. First look at the Starfighter, newest member of the Air Force's Century Series of Advanced Supersonic Combat Planes. This is the F-104, powered by a new and more powerful jet engine. The Lance-like craft has other new features, among them the first downward ejection seat system for a production jet fighter, whose operational altitude is the stratosphere. Described as the most advanced plane of its type, the Lockheed Starfighter goes through its paces. Defense Department films record the premiere of a new star blazing in the sky. Among the fighters of the 1950s was the Dassault Mystère series flown by the French as well as the Israeli Air Force. The Mystère 4 was used as both an interceptor and a ground attack fighter in the French war in Indochina. The 4A carried a twin 30mm DEFA cannon and featured the clean lines and sweep of the American Sabres. The 4B, renamed the Super Mystère, was the first European aircraft to fly at supersonic speed. On continuous alert for Soviet aggression, the United States put the Convair F-102 into service during the 50s as a key platform in the nation's air defenses. When the US ramped up its involvement in Vietnam the following decade, the F-102 was given fighter patrol and escort duties. In almost 10 years of flying, only 15 F-102s were lost. Vietnam was the biggest arena for American military might since the Korean War. The United States had the largest air force in the world and was pitted against a much smaller foe, communist North Vietnam. 
Initially, America planned to provide only strategic military support and equipment to South Vietnam. But as the war progressed, the US became more closely embroiled and committed jet aircraft in 1965. The main jet fighter was the McDonnell F-4 Phantom II. The two-seat carrier-based aircraft could carry a range of munitions, including conventional bombs, cluster bombs, air-to-ground missiles, and nuclear weapons. The fighter's superior thrust gave it a great tactical advantage, as the pilot could engage and disengage at will during combat. However, North Vietnamese pilots were wary of the American pilots' advanced skill and technology and rarely allowed themselves to be drawn into a dogfight. Really getting excited and, and disturbed because I was missing and one more rolling a dive maneuver to get behind him again. And then this time I all of the things in training came back to me about tracking the target, uh, getting the uh, the gun sight directly on him and, and making sure I had all the proper air speeds and G conditions and, and I fired the third missile and I observed this missile to go directly up his tailpipe and explode and blow the, blow the tail right off of him. And as uh, soon as the tail went, all kinds of pieces and parts of aircraft started coming back at me. And it was in a kind of a left turn and this stuff was coming back and I had to roll to the left some more to keep him from, from hitting it. And as I started this roll, I, I saw the MiG just pitch up real violently without a tail. He just pitched up and went back over my right wing and down. I came around real hard to the left so I could keep him in sight and, and watch him hit the ground so I could get a confirmed kill. The Enterprise will be joined by the nuclear-powered guided missile frigate Bainbridge to become the first nuclear-powered ships in history to enter combat. The Enterprise will be stationed off Saigon to launch planes for airstrikes against the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. The development of airborne warning and control systems planes equipped with advanced surveillance technology also benefited the American Air Force. And in October 1967, a Lockheed EC-121 AWAC aircraft directed an F-4 to a MiG-21, the first time such an intercept had been plotted by an airborne controller. Altogether, the United States Air Force brought down 68 North Vietnamese MiG-21s in the eight years of the war. The Cambodian Air Force flew both MiG-17s and MiG-25s, but refrained from combat in an attempt to maintain neutrality. In 1965, American forces were stunned when aging North Vietnamese MiG-17s shot down Mach 2-class F-105 Thunder Chief fighter bombers. Agile and maneuverable, MiG-17s can still be found in some air forces today. But the bulk of the Cambodian Air Force's fighter jets were destroyed on the ground in 1971 in a Viet Cong bombing raid on Phnom Penh. Another aircraft put into service at this time was the F-5 built by Northrop. This series of supersonic fighter aircraft included the F-5A and F-5B, or Freedom Fighter, the F-5E Tiger, and F-5F Tiger II. Designed as a low-cost, low-maintenance fighter, it was twin-engined with a top speed of Mach 1.6 and a range of 1,400 kilometers, and was armed with two 20mm cannons and a variety of missiles on seven hard points. Various versions and derivatives are still in use today as trainers. The Vietnam War also saw the birth of a new long-range defense fighter, the F-111. It embraced the prevailing strategic principles of the day, which focused on high speed, raw power, and air-to-air -air missiles, rather than dogfighting. The two-seater aircraft was powered by two afterburning Pratt & Whitney TF-30 turbofans, and a swing-wing mechanism allowed the wings to sweep or rotate allowing it to maneuver at blistering speeds. Internally, under the fuselage, the F-111 was equipped to carry a cannon, nuclear weapons, and air-to-air -air missiles. The aircraft could also carry various weapons under the wing.
When the F-111 went into service in 1967, it became the world's first variable wing technology aircraft. The French continued development of their Dassault Mirage line of fighters with the Mirage 3, 5, F1 and 2000 versions, all single-engined and capable of both supersonic air superiority and ground attack modes. They were sold to many nations. An Anglo-French design was the Spicat Jaguar. Introduced in 1973, the single-seater fighter could achieve Mach 1.6 with its twin Rolls-Royce Mark 102 turbofans. It was designed to replace the Phantom for close support and air superiority. The US Navy had developed the Phoenix. A long-range fleet defense anti-aircraft missile, it was a very heavy and sophisticated weapon, and for the first time, an aircraft was designed around the missile. It too was a variable wing aircraft, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, which went into operation in 1974, replacing the F-4. A two-seater, the Tomcat's canopy gives 360-degree visibility, and a head-up display allows the pilot to read the instrumentation while keeping his eyes glued on the sky. Internal 20mm M61 Vulcan Gatling guns are mounted on the left side, and the aeroplane can also carry AIM-7 Sparrow and AIM-9 Sidewinder anti-aircraft missiles and, of course, the AIM-54 Phoenix, the only aircraft to do so. The British performed their own technological leap in 1969 when they introduced the Harrier jump jet to the Air Force. The Harrier became the only successful vertical short takeoff and landing aircraft from the period and remains in service today. Its remarkable design allows the pilot to hover over the landing point and descend vertically. In a dogfight, the pilot can vector in forward flight as a defensive maneuver, coming to a sudden stop and forcing the pursuing aircraft to overshoot. The British sent Sea Harriers to the Falklands in 1982 for the war against Argentina. 28 Harriers operated from the decks of the HMS Hermes and Invincible. Another 14 arrived a month later, flying from the UK in nine hours with five mid-air refuelings. The Harriers were matched against Argentinian Mach 2 Dassault Mirage fighters and scored 22 kills with no loss. But two aircraft disappeared on night patrol. Flying more than 2,000 sorties during the operation, the Sea Harriers were a key reason for Britain's success in the war and the recovery of the Falkland Islands. The United States brought out the F-15 Eagle in 1976, and like the F-14, it was a highly engineered, complex piece of machinery. Designed as a response to the MiG-25 Interceptor, believed to be more advanced than it actually was, the F-15 is made from lightweight materials and contains two exceptionally powerful Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines, giving it an excellent thrust-to-weight ratio. The Eagle can zoom 29,000 feet upward, or the height of Mount Everest, in a minute. It was designed for just one person, so to make the pilot's tasks more manageable, all controls are placed on the throttle and stick, an innovation now standard on modern fighters. No F-15s have ever been lost in combat, and a squadron of Israeli F-15s and F-16s virtually wiped out Syria's air force of MiG-21 and 23 fighters in 1982 during the war in Lebanon due to a combination of superior flying and advanced technology. European designers tried to stay one step ahead of the Soviets' air power, and Swedish designers introduced the Saab Vigen in 1971. With an advanced forward canard wing, this single-engine fighter could reach speeds of Mach 2.1, range 1,000 kilometers, and a rate of climb of 12,200 meters per minute. The F-16 Fighting Falcon was introduced in 1978. The complexity of the F-14s and 15s made them expensive to produce, so the Falcon was designed to be cheaper to manufacture with better maneuverability for air-to-air -air combat. The lightweight aircraft is inherently unstable 
but advanced avionics make it flyable. A frameless bubble canopy provides excellent visibility. A side-mounted control stick is positioned to ease control when the pilot is pressed by massive G-forces, and a reclining seat makes it easier for the pilot to bear the forces. As with the Eagle, controls are mounted on the throttles and the control column, while a head-up display projects instrumentation onto the glass canopy, enabling the pilot to respond with split-second timing, an essential skill in modern aerial combat. Such innovations have made single-seater fighters more appealing, as it's now possible for one very well-trained person to handle the complexities of a fighter jet. European cooperation to counter Soviet forces also saw the development of the Panavia Tornado. Britain, Germany and Italy combined forces to produce this variable wing twin-engine fighter bomber. Crewed by two, this multi-role fighter had a top speed of up to Mach 2.12. Variants and developments are still in service today. One key feature was its terrain-following capability. The aircraft could hug the ground at high speed to avoid radar, and is considered one of the most significant fighters to come out of Europe. The FA-18 Hornet is both a fighter and an attack aircraft. Although slower than the Tomcat, the Hornet is exceptionally nimble, and its dual purpose means it can defend itself on the way to a target, drop its payload, and engage enemy fighters. The Hornet entered service in 1983 as a mid-wing multi-mission tactical aircraft. The reason for its agility comes from good thrust-to-weight ratio, digital fly-by-wire control system, and leading-edge extensions that allow it to remain controllable at high angles of attack. To switch between fighter and attack roles, the Hornet's pilot uses a multifunction display projected onto the canopy. Its twin engines, General Electric F404 GE400, were designed to be particularly robust, leading to reduced stall and flame-out. A little misnamed, the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk is a stealth aircraft, designated a fighter, but lacking guns and rarely carrying missiles. Its unique flat, faceted surfaces reflect radar emissions, and the various radar-absorbing materials are used on the cockpit and over the engine intakes. The Nighthawk is actually armed with smart weapons and a targeting system for precision attack and has a top speed of a staggering 2,220 kilometers an hour. One person pilots the stealth fighter aided by a wide array of electronic gadgets. But such cutting edge technology doesn't come cheap. Each Nighthawk costs $40 million. The stealth fighters proved their worth during the first Gulf War with their accurate striking. However, one was shot down by Serbian artillery in 1999 during the Kosovo conflict. Also developed by a European consortium, the Eurofighter or Typhoon has been adopted by six nations as their current frontline fighter. The twin Eurojet EJ200 turbofans generate a 1.16 thrust to weight ratio. The canard wing design is capable of Mach 1.2 at sea level and 2.1 at altitude. A multi-role fighter, it has one 27mm cannon and multiple hard points from missiles or bombs. The Lockheed Martin Boeing F-22 Raptor is a newer stealth fighter introduced into service in 2005. With a $137.5 million price tag, the stealth air superiority fighter is intended to replace the F-15 Eagle. The Raptor's top speed remains classified, but it's known that the design of the aircraft allows it to sustain supersonic flight without the use of afterburner augmented thrust. Like other stealths, the Raptor carries its air-to-air -air missiles in an internal cargo bay to enable stealth mode and reduce drag. However, the weapons bay doors only have to be opened for a second to launch its missiles. The United States is currently the only country manufacturing and flying the stealth fighter. 
With other countries waiting for the F-35 Lightning II to roll off the assembly line, an event expected to begin in 2011. At $83 million, the F-35 is substantially cheaper than the Raptor, but is still expected to perform many of the same functions. A stealth multi-role fighter, the F-35 will have three models. A conventional takeoff and landing variant, a short takeoff and vertical landing variant, and a carrier-based variant. With test flights currently underway, it has been observed that the single-engine F-35 appears to have a similar appearance to the two-engine Raptor. It will also incorporate the Raptor's advanced avionics and sensor fusion to improve the pilot's situational awareness and high-speed data networking, making it truly futuristic. From wood and fabric to radar-absorbing titanium alloys, speeds from 100 kilometers an hour to three times the speed of sound, fighter aircraft have come a long way in the past 100 years. Who knows what the future will bring?